Go ahead and turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. We are continuing our series on Baptist beliefs, what unites us, going through the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, which is our doctrinal statement as First Baptist Church Jacksonville, which is the doctrinal statement of all the Southern Baptist Convention and has been for many years. And tonight brings us to Article 10, which is on last things, last things, or end times. Or if you're using a more technical definition, uh, we refer to this in study of theology as eschatology. The eschatos is the last things, is the study of the last things. And in the back page of the uh, prayer sheet that you got on the way in is a card. We'll also have it on the screen here. I want to start by just reading Article 10 and then reading... uh, three verses from John 14, verses 1 to 3, and then asking the Lord's help in prayer tonight. Let's read this. This is Article 10. God, in his own time and in his own way, will bring the world to its appropriate end. According to his promise, Jesus Christ will return personally and visibly in glory to the earth. The dead will be raised, and Christ will judge all men in righteousness. The unrighteous will be consigned to hell, the place of everlasting punishment. The righteous and their resurrected and glorified bodies will receive their reward and will dwell forever in heaven with the Lord. In John 14, 1 to 3 reads, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. Let's pray. Oh, Father, tonight as we look at your word and we see what it teaches about the return of Christ, I pray, God, that you would help us to see with the eyes of faith what we will one day see with the eyes that you've given us. I pray, Father, that we would see the glory of Christ in his work now and his work to come. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, just recently, we took our kids to Disney World for the very first time. Even though we've lived in Disney World for almost, uh, lived in Jacksonville here in Florida for almost three years, some of our kids' friends, uh, they thought that their parents didn't love them because we didn't take them yet. And they tortured them with lots of tales about how wonderful Disney World is. So um, they asked us, can we please go? And we finally were able to make that trip. And so we did. And we made that trip. And even though they had heard a lot about Disney World, they had never been there themselves. And so they heard about it from friends. They had seen some stuff on TV. But they had a lot of questions because they'd never experienced it. You know, questions like, well, well, what are the rides like? Well, how many rides are there? Well, how long do you have to actually wait in line? Will I get to see any Disney characters? What's the food like? What's the most popular attraction? Are we there yet? (laughs) Heard that one more than once. So my kids asked all these questions ahead of time, and I did my best, the best of my knowledge, to try to answer it. But the, the main thing I wanted to point out to them, hey, listen, guys, I know you guys got a lot of questions. You'll figure it out when we get there. Really, what I just want you to know is the big picture. Here's the bottom line. The reality is we're going to Disney World, and it's going to be awesome. So just be excited about that. See, when it comes to last things or the end times and what they're going to be like, we could often be like my kids before they went to Disney World. We know we're going to get there, but we got a lot of million, but we got about a million questions on the way there. You know, questions like, well, what is heaven going to be like? What's the rapture and when will that be? Well, what's the millennium and when will that happen? What will it be like then? When will we end up there? What's going to happen to Israel? What are the signs of Christ's return? Has it already happened? Who is the Antichrist? What's the mark of the beast? Are all these things coming now? And just like my kids' questions before Disney, all these are are valid questions, and we can seek to try to answer them to the best of our knowledge, faithfully, from the Bible. But most of these questions and their answers are not what unites us as Baptists. What unites us as Baptists is the big picture. The big picture doesn't change. The big picture doesn't have different answers. The big picture of the end times, of last things, is that Jesus is coming again and it's going to be awesome. That's the bottom line. 
And this is what our doctrinal statement rightly emphasizes. So in keeping with what the Bible emphasizes, in keeping with what our doctrinal statement emphasizes, what we're going to focus on tonight is the big picture. That Jesus is coming again, and it's going to be awesome. But before moving on to discuss exactly what the confession says, I want to first just take a minute and talk about what it doesn't say, what it does not say. I just want to point this out again before moving on. This statement of faith is put together by lots of Baptist leaders, lots of Baptist pastors and Baptist theologians. Uh, One of the Baptist leaders that helped put this current revision together in 2000 was actually our senior pastor at the time in 2000 that worked on this along with others. And um, what I want to point out is that even though all these different people have come together, they wisely chose what to put in here and what to not put in here because lots of these Baptist leaders and Baptist theologians and Baptist pastors had different views on a lot of these questions. And so this statement of faith does not intentionally take a position on a lot of things that Christians debate. So in this statement, in the card, on the, in our confession of faith, it doesn't say anything about the rapture, doesn't say anything about the tribulation, doesn't say anything about the millennium, doesn't say anything about how you should interpret revelation, doesn't say anything about the antichrist, doesn't say anything about Israel, doesn't say anything about any of those things. And the reason is, is because there's different views among Baptists. And for some people that have only been a member of one church for a long time or only been exposed to one set of teaching about end times, you might not realize that even among Baptist leaders, there's a variety of views, both today and throughout Baptist history, and among Christians, wider Christians as well. And when it's interesting, when you look at church history, you get a bigger perspective to see, just see what, which views have been popular at different times in church history for different reasons. Let me just give an example. Let's take the millennium, for example. For much of church history, especially in the beginning, for many years, the, uh, what is called the amillennial interpretation has been the most popular. That is that there's no literal future millennial kingdom, but the millennium is during the church age because it refers to the period between Christ's first coming and his second coming. I think the reason, one of the reasons at least, that this was one of the most popular views is because it was taught by Augustine, who was by far the most influential theologian in the first millennia, the first thousand years of church history. Going a little later in church history, the post-millennial interpretation has been really popular. And that was for lots of different reasons, especially during the age of exploration and the age of colonization of the new worlds. Many, most of the early pilgrims that came to America were post-millennial, meaning that they believed that Christ would return post or after the millennial kingdom. So the millennium didn't start with Christ's return, it, it uh, preceded it, because the return of Christ was after that. So they believed that their efforts to spread the gospel actually were gonna usher in the millennium. That's what they believed. And as Baptists, we're proud to say that, you know, the modern missions movement was started by Baptists. William Carey in England brought the gospel to India and started a whole movement. Adoniram Judson from America brought the gospel to Burma and started a whole missions movement in America. We trace our lineage back to them uh, in terms of missions. Both of them were committed Baptists, and both of them were committed post-millennialists, and they believed that their missions work was an attempt to help bring in the millennium kingdom, that Christ would return after that. That's what they believed, just like the pilgrims did in America. They were bringing the gospel to America. And then in the last 150 years or so, the premillennial view has been really popular, that Christ will return before or pre the millennium. And along with that, around the mid-19th century, for the first time in church history, they developed uh, the, the view of the uh, pre-tribulational rapture came about around the same time. And that's been really popular, especially through the influence of the Schofield Reference Bible in the early 1900s. And then in more recent years with the Left Behind novel series, it's really helped that view to be really popular, especially in America and the Western church. Now, none of this tells us what the Bible teaches, and none of this tells us what we should believe. We don't believe anything because it's popular in church history. We believe it because we believe it's what the Bible teaches. But I just share all that to provide some perspectives. What church history can do is help us get a bigger perspective over the influences that have happened and how different Baptists and different Christians have thought about these issues over the years and for different reasons. 
And it helps us to be more humble on why we believe what we believe from the Bible. And as Pastor Heath made us all promise in a sermon series on Revelation, we promise not to fight over these issues, not to divide over them. Because while we might want to debate our view of the end times, what we can't do is divide over them. We can't divide over them. These particular views are not what unites us as Baptists. And the reason I spent all this time going into this before we jump into the confession is because I'm trying to make a point. I've seen this firsthand. I've seen this firsthand. Christians not just debating these issues, but dividing over them. Churches dividing over them. Individuals dividing over them. And it's just so sad. And it's damaging to Christian unity. And it's damaging to the church. Because they're fighting about things they shouldn't fight over. And they call names, oh, you don't read the Bible literally, or you don't believe in inerrancy, or you don't believe it the way I do, so you must be a liberal. And we can throw names around, but it's just a way of dividing and not uniting around what the Bible teaches. And what unites us in our doctrinal statement and what unites us as Baptists is the gospel. What unites us is the Trinity. What unites us is inerrancy and inspiration of Scripture. And as Baptists, what unites us is our view of the church and our view of baptism. These are the things that unite us as Christians and particularly as Baptists. And when it comes to the last things or the end times, what unites us is the big picture, the bottom line, which is that Jesus is coming again and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. So that's what the Baptist Hidden Message 2000 does not say. But what does it say? What is it that should unite us as Baptists when it comes to the issue of last things, end times? Well, there's three aspects in this statement of faith about uh, the return of Christ that we need to look at. And I want to pose it as three questions. So first, number one, when will Jesus return? When will Jesus return? We'll look at the first line of the statement of faith. It says, God, in his own time, and his own way will bring the world to its appropriate end. So the first thing to note is, when it comes to the timing, is that we need to know that God is in charge of all history, including the end. Think of a passage like Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. It says of God, it says, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God is in charge of all history. God is in charge of everything that will happen from the beginning to the end. And in his own time, God, in his own time, in his own way, will bring it all to its appropriate end. And he has set a day. Look at Acts uh, 17. Look at Acts 17 with me. Acts 17, verse 30 and 31 says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So God has picked a day. God has picked a time when he will bring all things to an end. And when that day comes, he will have appointed Jesus as judge of all things because it's when Jesus returns. That's when all things will come to an end, when he returns. Acts 17, 30, and 31. But God has not told us when that day is. We don't know when that day is. Look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 42 to 44. Gives us a warning. It says, therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will come. So this passage tells us that we don't know when that is. If we would have known, we would have prepared for it differently. Just like if a thief would have said, hey, he called you up, hey, you know what, I'm gonna come break in your house around one in the morning, does that work for you? Great, well, just get ready, I'm gonna be on my way. (laughs) No, Jesus comes like a thief in the night, we don't know when that'll happen. We have to be ready now at all times. 
but he's fixed today. But when he comes, it'll be unexpected. We won't know what it is. This teaching that we don't know when this is, it smacks in the face of so many groups that want a date set. They want to set dates. They want to give an exact date for when that's going to happen. And it just leads Christians down the wrong path. Think about all the, the hubble-lub about uh, 2012, the end of the Mayan calendar and alien invasion and supernova. Who all knows what was going to happen in 2012? But guess what? <laughs> that came and went nine years ago. The world's not over yet. God didn't bring it to an end yet. Or how about all the Y2K fervor? I mean, it was unbelievable. People thought the world was going to end and the, the banks were going to implode or something and uh, Jesus was going to come back, I guess. That's the only way to solve it all. Well, that was 21 years ago. We're still going. Or think of uh, even people that have maybe a little closer to home for some evangelicals. Um, there's been lots of false prophets that have proven themselves to be false prophets. Uh, people like Harold Camping. He was very popular on family radio. Twelve different times he set dates starting in 1994. The most recent, the, the, the most biggest date he really emphasized was May 21st in 2011. And then what did he do after May 21st came? Well, two days later, oh, I miscalculated. It's actually uh, October 21st, 2011. And that day came and went. Meanwhile, lots of people sold everything. They were all ready for his coming. And they, were, they waited and Jesus didn't come back. He tried to set a date. Lots of cults have done this over the years. The Jehovah's Witnesses, most recently in 1975, they predicted that would be when Jesus returns and everything would be over. That wasn't the last time or the first time either. They also did it in 1941, the first time going back to 1914. Each time, everyone was all excited and ready. That's when Jesus was going to come back, and it didn't happen. Or even like the Jim Jones, the People's Temple, he said in 1967 there's going to be a nuclear holocaust. Lots and lots of times throughout church history, people have said dates, this is when the end is going to be. And in every case, so far, they've been wrong. I remember when, uh, um, during the Gulf Wars, in the early 90s, everyone thought, oh, this must be it. This must be the end. And what they do is Christians, they take the newspaper and they try to read the Bible through the newspaper. They call it newspaper eschatology. And interpret the Bible through that. It doesn't work. We don't know. Christ could not come for another thousand years, or he could come tonight. We don't know. We don't know. So when you try to read the Bible through the newspaper, we're going to be led astray. It's a sure sign of a false prophet that they want to give a date, because God has not told us when that will be. He just told us to be ready for it. So in terms of the timing, God in his own way, in his own time, will bring the world to its appropriate end. We don't know. What we do know for sure is that Christ will return. So the question to us is, what will it be like when he returns? How will Jesus' return look like? What's the manner of his return? Look at the next line in the statement. It says, according to his promise, Jesus will return personally, visibly in glory to the earth. According to his promise, he promises that he will come. And when he comes, he says that he will come personally. Jesus himself will personally come. Think of a passage like Pastor Scott read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. It says, for the Lord himself. He doesn't send someone else. He doesn't just send an angel. He doesn't just send someone else to do his bidding. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. He will come personally to come and rescue his people. Jesus himself will come. In the same way he left, he will return. And it says he will come visibly, visibly. Matthew 24, 27 says, For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Just, I think, yesterday or two days ago, I was driving in to work in the morning, and there was this big lightning storm. <sighs> lightning crashed down right next to the highway twice. On the way to work, I was like, wow. I mean, you couldn't miss it. If you're anywhere nearby, you were going to see the lightning. Nothing was going to obstruct your view. Nothing was blocking the sound. It didn't matter if you had the music blasting. You would have seen it and you would have heard it. In the same way, when Jesus returns, you're not going to miss it. There's no secret coming that you didn't see. When he returns, all will see it like a flash of lightning. And everyone will know that Jesus has returned. There'll be no mistaking the fact that Jesus has come back. And all will see it. So we'll come back personally, come back visibly, and he'll come back in glory. Think of passages like Luke 21, 27. 
Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. This is the biggest difference between his first coming and his second coming. In his first coming, many people didn't see him. Because when he came, he came in humility, not in exaltation. He came as a babe in a manger. He came in an unrecognizable way to many. Those of the eyes of faith saw him, but everyone else didn't see him. He lived a lowly life. Poor, unremarkable, invisible to many. But when he comes back the second time, he's going to come back in glory. He's going to come back with power. He's going to come back for all to see. Unmistakable. And when he returns, he's not coming as the gentle lamb. He's coming back as the reigning king, the conquering king, who's going to suppress all who've raised their fist to him. He's going to establish his rule on earth forever and ever. When he comes as a conquering king, there's a result to that return. That's the last question. What will happen when Jesus returns? What will happen when he returns? And this is the last part of our statement. It says, And the dead will be raised, and Christ will judge all men in righteousness. When Christ returns, the dead will be raised. When Christ returns, everyone is raised. Everyone is raised. John 5, 27 to 29 teaches us. It says, And he gave him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, and everyone will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, the worst who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. All who have died will be raised, and then everyone will be judged. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20, verses 11 to 13. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, verse 12, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. No one can hide from God's judgment. There will be no exceptions for those who will stand before Christ in judgment. There's no passes, no amount of money you can buy your way out, no amount of success you can claim to escape it, no slipping through the cracks, no evading the judgment, no getting off easy. Everyone will be judged. Everyone will be judged by Christ. Everyone with all of their thoughts and all of their deeds will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone will be judged. And there'll be no special treatment. And there'll be two verdicts rendered. And that's the last part of our statement. It says, the unrighteous will be consigned to hell, the place of everlasting, everlasting punishment. The righteous in their resurrected and glorified bodies will receive the reward, will dwell forever in heaven with the Lord. The unrighteous will be consigned to hell, the place of everlasting punishment. Look at the next two verses in Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Hell has many descriptions in the Bible. It's often been said that Jesus had more words to say about hell than he did about heaven, and that is true. And the descriptions of hell are horrific and graphic. Matthew 25, 41 describes it as an eternal fire. It never goes out. It'll last forever. Mark 9, 43, it's unquenchable. No matter of water, no matter of time will make any difference. It's an unquenchable fire. Revelation 14, 11 says the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. It's an eternal conscious torment in a real place called hell. 
2 Thessalonians 1.9 says the penalty is eternal destruction and it's away from the presence of the Lord. The greatest horror of hell is away from the presence of the Lord forever and ever and ever. There is no escape from the horrors of hell once you experience it. I remember sharing the gospel with a group of friends one time, trying to warn them about the judgment to come, warn them of what hell was. And they said, well, hey, listen, you keep telling us that we're going to be in hell and all of us are going to be there together if we don't trust in Jesus. Well, hey, that's not sound like such a bad place if we're all in there together. It sounds like we'll have a big party in hell. I'm like, no, no. You're sadly mistaken if you think that's what hell is. Hell is not a place we want to be, but hell is a real place. It's a place we don't want to think about. It's a place that stretches our thoughts, stretches our credulity, stretches even our understanding of the holiness and justice of God. But it's a real place, a place that people will be in, a place that people will be facing eternal punishment. And there's only one way to avoid hell. There's only one way to avoid hell. That's through the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe some of you right here are wondering about where you're going to be when you die. And you don't know the verdict that's going to come when Jesus stands in judgment of the living and the dead and all your thoughts and deeds are on display for judgment before Christ. You have to know that there's a penalty that needs to be paid because of your sin, because of your sin that you've committed, because of your sin in Adam, because of the sin that you've validated over and over again with every unrighteous thought and deed you've ever committed. You stand justly before God's judgment and there's a penalty to be paid because the wages of sin is death, not just death in this life, but an eternal death, the second death, the death that does not end, the death that lasts forever, the death that brings the horror of eternal conscious torment that does not end day or night. That's a payment that has to be paid. And either, either you will pay it or Christ will pay it, but there is no other option. And if you're going to pay that penalty, you have to pay that penalty forever and ever and ever and ever and ever in hell. Or Christ and his eternal person can pay that payment fully and completely as a sinless son of God, taking upon him the full wrath of God on the cross for us and rising in victory and resurrection and offering you the forgiveness, offering you the escape from hell, offering you the resurrection life that he's won if you would trust in Jesus. It's the only way to escape the consignment to hell of the unrighteous because we all start off unrighteous. That's the state we're all born into. And we all justly deserve hell until Christ has won it for us and we trust in him with repentance and faith. Well, there is another verdict, the last verdict, the happy verdict. It says, the righteous in their resurrected and glorified bodies will receive the reward and will dwell forever in heaven with the Lord. None of us start off righteous, but through the righteousness of Christ, we can be declared righteous and we can receive the reward of resurrection, of presence with God forever. And that's the reality described in the very next verses in Revelation 21. Look at these verses, Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And verse 4, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the wellspring of water of eternal life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. (laughs) It's a day of horror and a day of judgment for those who are unrighteous. But for those in Christ... It's a day of unspeakable joy, a day filled with glory, a day of God's presence, a day of reward, a day of unending perfect fellowship that we call the new heavens and the new earth, when there'll be no more pain, 
No more pain, no more knee pain, no more back pain, no more headaches, no more eyes deteriorating and needing glasses, no more unwanted weight gain, no more paying taxes, <laughs> no more injustices in society, no more racism, no more unequities, no more poverty, no more mourning, no more saying goodbye to loved ones, no more of any of that, no more regret. All of it will be wiped away and finished. And that happens when Christ returns. And he welcomes us into the reward he's given us. We've resurrected glorified bodies to join him for all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. It only comes when Jesus returns. It's not just a death. Death is the end of this life's existence for many of us, but it's not the end of our existence, and it's not the final existence. Sometimes I hear Christians say, well, oh my goodness, I'm experiencing so much suffering pain, I just can't wait till I die. Well, I understand why you're saying that, and it is the end of a physical pain, and the Bible does teach to be absent in the body, to be present in the Lord, but none of this is a full reality until Christ returns. We're waiting for the resurrection of our bodies when we get the body like Christ won. His is the first fruits of the body we will get. And that doesn't happen until he returns. And then he glorifies us. Then he gives us the resurrected body. Then will come the saying that death is no more. Then will the, death of, the sting of death will be drained and the last enemy will be defeated. And no more will we have to worry about that. When Christ returns, redemption will be complete. And that's the bottom line. And that's the big picture, that Jesus is coming again, and it's going to be awesome. And Jesus comes back. There's a lot we could say about the return of Christ and what we should do with it, but I just want to leave you with two final thoughts for what to do with this return of Christ. Two applications for us. First of all, I hope you already feel this. When we think about the return of Christ, it should fill us with hope. It should fill us with hope. There, there's more than this life. There's, there's more that's going to happen. This is not the sum total of our existence. This is not even the majority of it. We're going to live forever and ever and ever in God's presence, in the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus is coming again, and he's going to make all things right. Every time you've been cheated, every time someone's wronged you, every time you've not gotten the forgiveness that you thought you were due, and you're tempted to take vengeance on them, just know that God will take care of that through Jesus Christ. It's not for you to have to worry about. You can let that go. You can be hope-filled. That's going to be better. This world is not all there is. We're not working for everything just in this life. That also means that no matter what suffering and trial you're facing, no matter what it is, it'll all be done away with when Christ returns. Even the greatest suffering in this life is but a little while compared to the eternity we have with Christ. And if we can endure the worst thing that could possibly happen to, happen to us, which is death itself, which he promises to rise us again if we die, that we can endure anything. And we don't need to be afraid. And we can have hope in this life that Christ will return and make all things right. Lastly, not only does it fill us with hope, but it also fuels us to action. We should be ever thinking about the return of Christ. All those warnings about not knowing the day or the hour aren't just to get us to stop worrying about the date setters because they did get one thing right. They were preparing. They had the wrong date because we don't know the date, but they were getting ready for it. And we don't know when Christ can come back. And so we need to be ready. We don't know when eternity is going to be set for our neighbor, for our loved one, for our coworker. Because when Christ returns, their, state, their fate is sealed. Now is the time to offer them salvation. Now is the time to call them to faith and repentance, to warn them of the horrors of hell. Because when Christ returns, it's too late. So now is when we should go and tell them what Christ has done for them. They would but trust in him, and they can be saved. And also, maybe there's some sins you're wrestling with right now that you don't want to be judged for. Repent of them now. Don't be wasting your life doing things that you're going to regret. Live your life for Christ, because we're all going to give an account. Knowing Christ is coming back should fuel us to action. And the bottom line is this. There's the big picture. The simple reality is that Christ is coming again. 
And it's going to be awesome. We're going to be excited to meet him and see him no longer with the eyes of faith, but eyeball to eyeball, the Bible says. And we'll welcome him and live with him for all eternity if we've trusted in Christ. Christ is coming again, and it's going to be awesome. Let's pray. And Father, I pray for the dear saints here that you allow these words of the return of Christ to bring comfort, to bring hope, to bring joy in the midst of lots of suffering that this world offers. I pray, Father, that we would unite as believers at First Baptist Church Jackson, but we would unite as Baptists and we would unite as Christians everywhere around the central truth that Christ is coming again. That we would live in light of it. We would be fueled to action do we not allow even this Easter Sunday, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Christ to go by without a fresh plea to unbelievers we know to not miss this chance to trust in Christ before their fate is sealed at the day of judgment when Christ returns. I pray, Father, that all of us would live in light of the return of Christ because we know it is sure and certain. We draw hope from it. We thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.